so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our panel discussion on infrastructure. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the lunch and now you are ready to hear some tips uh, and tricks from our panelists on uh, how you can maintain the infrastructure within your open source project. Uh, my name is Lenka Bocinsova. I'm part of the open source program office within Red Hat, uh, working as a community architect focusing on the cloud native projects. Um, and um, and during this panel discussion, we would like to, uh, you know, like involve you as well uh, in the in it. So if you have any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to ask it uh, during the session. Just raise your hand, and uh, I will give you a word. Okay? So don't worry about that. And with that being said, uh, I would like to welcome our panelists and uh, give them the word to introduce themselves. So maybe Michal, we can start with you. So my name is Michal Konečný. I'm team lead for Fedora Infrastructure and Relaunch team. Uh, I'm working as a senior Red Hat, uh, senior software engineer in Red Hat as well. But my role is more in the Fedora. So you can ask me uh, anything about Fedora Infrastructure. I know that I'm team lead for Relaunch team, but I don't know much about the Relaunch work. So keep the questions for the infrastructure. Uh, and I'm working on Fedora infrastructure for six years now, so I should be able to answer most of the questions. Okay, so my name is uh, Michael. I'm a principal system administrator in the open source program office, the same office as Jason with my boss and as Lenka with my coworker. Yeah, and... Uh, Please come, and I also ask a few people that I pay to ask questions, so. <laughs> but uh, they were late like me. <laughs> um, I'm at Red Hat since uh, 2011. I'm in that uh, job since 10 years. I'm hoping that I'm going to get some uh, cake or something, <laughs> if we have budget, of course. And I'm mostly working on smaller projects that do not have dedicated uh, system administration team. Like, I'm not working with Fedora. I mean, I do from time to time, but uh, not dealing with CentOS. The biggest project I help is Gluster, which might bring some memory to some people, and some other was like, hey, we used to do that, and uh, no, we don't anymore. And uh, what else? I usually not late to my own talk. That was the first time for me. And you can ask me any question. I likely do not have the answer, but I like to discuss. That's why I was not here in time. And I will give the mic to my boss. <laughs> hey, I'm Jason Brooks. I am a manager in Red Hat's open source program office. Uh, and then I, I have a team that works like directly with open source projects. And so we are often the uh, consumer of uh, community infra uh, stuff. And also am, uh, have a team that uh, Michael's on where we provide infrastructure support to projects. And it's uh, like, like Michael said, lots of kind of smaller projects that are in some ways strategic to Red Hat, but they tend to need some help uh, on infra. Uh, thank you so much. And I just realized that, so we now introduced our panelists, but we would like to know something about you as well. Uh, so maybe just raise your hand how many of you are maintainers of the, some open source project? Okay. So we have like one quarter of the audience. So, uh, and how many of those of you are focusing on the infrastructure uh, of your project? Okay. <laughs> so basically the, all the hands that were raised before. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, that's helpful. So uh, as uh, some people join us now, uh, so please feel free to ask questions during the session. Uh, and uh, I will start uh, the sessions with a very generic one. Um, so I can imagine that uh, the projects are in uh, different stages. Um, you know, like some some mm, some people are uh, starting their projects, uh, but some are more uh, matured. Uh, and every time, like when they are starting it, so. Uh, they are thinking about what is the best infrastructure uh, for for their project. Uh, so, what would you suggest? Like, what should be a criteria for the projects to have the 
uh, efficient um, infrastructure within their team. Maybe. So I think one of the first things that you need to consider uh, when you're looking at this is what your strategy is for your project. What are you trying to accomplish? Because that will uh, guide a lot of what you end up needing. And so, you know, what, what's the level of contribution you're looking for? What's the level of discussion? Yeah, are you dreaming of being, you know, a part of a, some particular software foundation at some point? You know, uh, you, you know, you can make choices that align well with uh, with that group, you know, in that case. But being, you know, and it's for infrastructure and for a lot of other things, one of the number one things is just get clear on what your goals are as a project. So that's where I would start. Well, I think there is also the question of what you mean by efficient. Um, sometimes you have a lot of time to discuss what you want. And sometimes somebody say, oh, we need to present that for a big conference in Denver next week. Can you help us? And then efficient mean it needs to be done by yesterday. It's a totally unrelated example. It didn't happen this year, of course. Sometimes there is complicated question on whether you have budget or not. So it's more efficient to pay a company for that, but there is no budget. So you take the slow road and do something by yourself. Um, sometimes there is just uh, people that like to have their way. Uh, what I've seen with community manager is each time someone takes the community, the website gets a revamp, moving from WordPress to static, static to WordPress, to some uh, new system. And people want something. I'm not here to say what they need to do unless they ask. So if they want something changed there, then it's more efficient to do what they want rather than fight for three weeks. And in the end, people say, OK, I listen to you, but do like I say. I can just add something. It's uh, just as others said, it depends on the project, what you need, actually. So you need to uh, decide what if you need some database, if you need some server, if you need a web page, hold the bank up somewhere. It depends really on the project. So that is uh, how you actually decide what resources you need and what uh, you can do. And on the efficiency side, yeah, as I said, it depends on the project itself. So in some project, it's okay to have some one server, one hardware that will just sit somewhere. So for some projects, it's uh, you need plenty of machines that will actually be run somewhere, for example, for building something. So yeah, as Ota said, it depends. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and uh, you also mentioned that you know, like uh, some some projects had limited resources, right? Uh, or can have uh, either it can be money or it can be also like they don't have people uh, who are taking care of it. Uh, so, what would be your recommendation, like how they can uh, find these resources? So that one is easy. Just come to my team because we have resource. And in the past, when we had less resource. We managed to be successful getting sponsorship. It's getting harder to say, oh, we are a poor small company, we have no money when you are no longer a poor small company. But I remember back in the day that yeah, getting one server here and then, that was doable. CentOS did it, Fedora did it, other Linux distribution did it, Debian still do it. Nowadays, well, I just uh, ask to my boss that can explain all the budget magic. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, I think it's an obvious thing is when you have limited resources, because there's, there's uh, you know, money resources, but then there's also, like, what popped into my head when you mentioned getting a server is like, okay, so, you know, now what? I mean, the people resources can be some of the scarcest. Uh, so, but I think it, it, in some ways things have gotten a little cl simpler these days with there's all these different forges that you can kind of get started with just like the basics you know github or gitlab and so you know that's a good start and the, and the other piece about that is that uh, you are uh, uh, reducing your need for you know administrators to uh, to handle the machines but then you quickly will start to run out of those resources 
Okay, I can speak only for the Fedora project in this case. So in case of Fedora, we actually can provide resources for projects that are related to Fedora. So if you have some idea that could be helpful for a Fedora project itself, we can provide the machines that you need to run. We even have uh, something called CommuniShift, which is uh, made for people that just want to try those ideas. And uh, that could be provided for you. It's a open shift machine you will ca you can just use for something. Okay, I see a question there. Oh, the question was, how do you get access to CommuniShift? So to CommuniShift, you will create a ticket in Fedora Infrastructure Repo. We have docu documentation for and the guidelines how to request it and what you need to uh, accept to actually do uh, have it. Uh, this is for to be actually compliant with some of the laws. Uh, otherwise, we just want you to try the idea and have some place to actually do it. Okay. Do any questions from the audience? Oh yeah. Okay. Hi, I, I, I'm interested if you have any experience with uh, like managing or taking care of uh, like hybrid infrastructure in the sense that you know multiple systems are running in different environments like in data center, in AWS or GCP or I don't know IBM Cloud even right because of maybe different architectures and if you have any experience how to you know keep the sanity while maintaining this infrastructure, keeping up to date, configured, managed like whether you have some success stories or some technologies that help you. Keep saying. Okay, so in Fedora, we actually have hybrid infrastructure. We have uh, machines that are running in data center. We have AVS account that we are using. Uh, we are providing OpenShift uh, for people, so containers. And we even have uh, uh, different architectures like Power9 Power or uh, Arch. And, uh, in this case, uh, it's for us uh, in Fedora Infra, it's we are using Ansible for most of the managing of those machines. Uh, we have your own Ansible repository. We have secrets that are uh, separated from it, but they are included in all the playbooks when it's being run. We have some management so people from some groups can run their own playbooks and can run the others. So uh, the Ansible is really great for managing that, ma that the fleet of the machines because yeah, there are plenty of them. We still have few machines that need manual intervention. Uh, they are usually uh, need password when doing something with them in uh, uh, input it and we don't find it somewhere in Ansible or it's usually authentication systems and so on, so you don't want to have them. Uh, does anybody else want to add something? Uh, yeah, so we use the same things. Uh, for Gluster, I think I even stole some uh, Fedora playbook, um, mostly the ones that install virtual machine. And we decided to move to AWS sometime in the past. It stopped because people started to leave uh, the project. But in the end, we use AWS as a provider for VM. We decided to not integrate with all the API in case everything changed. So basically, just we get a VM for the CI, the CI trash it. I just go to AWS console, I click delete, I go to bed, the system run with a cron and reinstall. And it turns out that when you do the CI for a file system, it tends to break the kernel quite often. So that was great before I was fixing them manually. And yeah, we also use Ansible for OpenShift, which is YAML that generate YAML that generate a container that run on a VM in a cloud. But uh, it's more efficient. I'm not an engineer, so what do I know? Uh, yeah, we are basically the same system with one big repository. Um, we run it from our own laptop because we have two people in the team. The other half of the team is somewhere in the audience. I'm not going to point at him. And for Gluster, it's even worse. We have something, some post-commit script that is like Ansible Tower, but before Tower. And 
yeah, that's good. But I'm the only one in the world using it, so that's why I'm happy. <laughs> and yeah, we manage that by making sure that we use the same system, a Linux system. Sometimes, usually it's CentOS. Sometimes I want to live dangerously and I use uh, Fedora, but not that often because that, that not that dangerous anymore. So yeah, you have something to add? No, yep, we got it. Yeah, thank you. And we have another one. Uh, so it's great to hear what the infrastructure layer of a project does for its project community, but what are some things that the project's community can do to help its infrastructure layer back? <laughs> I can do that. I can do that. So in case of Fedora, you can always donate machines. We don't have much donated machines right now. The same I c can be see can be said for most of the open source projects. You can always donate machines if you want. Most of the projects will just say yes. We are we're happy to have one more machine, so that would be nice. Uh, and in other case, you can always uh, contribute to your Ansible repository. You can contribute to uh, infra, just uh, taking the tickets and uh, going through the tickets. This will help us a, a lot because we don't have that much season means that could actually to, uh, take it and do the work. It will take you some time before you get the permissions through what you need, but in case you are good, we will provide you the permissions and you can work on that. Well, for us, it's more complicated since we are helping most of the time small projects that have no sysadmin. Uh, we do not get a community helping us. For example, for Gluster, I think that the only contribution I had was adding package to the build system. Everything else was done by the existing community team. So if you want to help us, you can maintain things upstream. Uh, for example, making sure that the discourse container works easily on OpenShift, which is not the case right now. This kind of thing that will benefit to more than just us. From the Ansible perspective, people could contribute and they could be reused, but that come with complexity and with Ansible that make things very slow and this kind of thing. So I prefer to have something streamlined that I can understand than some gigantic uh, Ansible playbook that does everything and that I have to maintain. That's what happened with Puppet in the past for people from the OpenStack world. They likely know what I'm thinking about. And you can always send the cake and chocolate and even directly money. Uh, just do not tell to my boss because I will have to pay tax. <laughs> yeah, the, the, if, if the project is of, of a big enough size that it does have an infra team that is like a, like a contribute the team that you can contribute to you know you can contribute in the same way and then and that's really great I mean that's an often overlooked part but then you know what, what Michael you said about uh, making upstream contributions you know there's lots of things like uh, we do a lot of hosting of uh, mailman 3 instances for projects and packaging you know we like to run things on and uh, you know packaged and that's always an area that needs support or uh, Running things on OpenShift or Kubernetes, a lot of applications are kind of not oriented to, to run in that way, and so getting involved uh, there in, in ways that, uh, you know, with that kind of packaging type of work is something that uh, really, because then when it comes to, to host it, and uh, it's in that much better shape uh, to do it, so it makes everyone's lives easier. So there's a lot of points along the chain, but it can be tricky. Uh, Making you know infra contributions, it kind of takes a certain skill set, and uh, you know it takes work to uh, accept those contributions. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I can mention that that um, I just mentioned websites. Uh, one of the things that I'm running into is that many projects are requesting help with the with the website, and those are the contributions that sometimes 
project really don't ask or they don't mention in their um, contributor guide. So uh, I would say that this is this is really nice way how you can contribute. So if you have this skill set or, or if you are interested in that, I think this might be a very good for any community. So, yeah. Yep. Okay, so in Fedora we have apps and website team. So those are the folks you can reach. And I want to add as well the documentation. Uh, we are always looking for people who can actually look at the documentation and just go to what is there and say, yeah, this is okay, or this needs to be updated, this is not okay. So just this is contribution as well, and it will be helpful for the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you so much. Oh, we have questions. And I could see that the hand was raised there, Matthew. <laughs> but maybe you can. Uh, first, I want to say, yeah, the website the apps team in Fedora is awesome, and that's basically an entirely new team because the previous team had fallen dormant. So this is a lot of uh, community volunteers who kind of came together to build a really beautiful new website for the project, and that's uh, it, it's an awesome success. Um, but I also had a question. Uh, Jason, you said something about it being a lot of work to accept um, accept contributions. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit more? I don't know quite how to make this a question. It's, uh, how do you how do you deal with that? How do you make space for that? Can you mitigate that somehow? What? Um, yeah. Say more, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, it's a. You know, we were in the uh, uh, upstream maintainers meetup this morning, and uh, there was the topic came up a few times about some of these projects, Open SSL, uh, RPM. There, there were maintainers from those projects talking about how, you know, uh, it's challenging receiving contributions uh, because these are very sensitive to breakage, you know, and uh, uh, you have to be really careful with it. And it's like this with these these systems that kind of are running the projects, you know, the projects are relying on them to, to, to stay up and be uh, boring and reliable. So it does, so it takes work just to, to bring people along. You also have to kind of build up levels of trust for, for the people who have access to these systems. and. Uh, I don't know that there's a shortcut to it. You know, it takes it takes community building work for that. And I think it's challenging too because that's kind of a a meta community in some ways that people might show up and say, Well, I care about the the software that we're producing and then you that's why I, I mentioned in the in the larger community is where you have, you know, more contributors and so you out of that pool of contributors you can get, you know, some people who want to contribute to that portion of it. But and I realize that I'm in my saying more, I'm not really giving solutions. Uh, but I don't know, uh, what have you seen as successful ways to kind of encourage in for a contribution? So one successful way I've seen and it's kinda counterintuitive. So to give the whole story, um, we have some community ISP in force. They are organized as non-for-profit. And a long time ago, I was traveling around before the pandemics, and I was discussing with people, and one of them showed me how they were using DNS mask for their Wi-Fi covering the town. And I was like, yeah, but uh, you just have the DNS mask config file, and people have to deploy manually. It could be more automated, and he said, yeah, but if you automate more, someone has to maintain. If you just have the file, people know the file, they can reuse that, and they understand how to do things manually, and that makes it simpler. And yeah, when I do deploy a thing with Ansible on OpenShift, you need to know Ansible, OpenShift, my dozen of playbooks that are all separated in a very careful way, it's complicated. At the same time, you just get something on GitHub, you just copy and paste, and people do not touch it, and that's it, you forget about it. So you need to have something simple, but uh, if you want to automate, it gets complicated. Um, yeah, as long as I will be paid full time, I will produce complicated f stuff because I will maintain in several years. If I was not, I would try to do something very simple, the simple possible, the simplest stuff possible. And too bad if it's not perfect, but at least someone can come and say, oh, I need to change that file, copy, restart, that's it. That's very easy. So yeah, you cannot optimize for getting a community, uh, getting your sysadmin happy 
at least not without booze, obviously. So uh, I, I am always wondering, uh, I'm, I'm managing quite a few applications for our team in Federal Infrastructure Cluster, and from time to time we are rotating API keys, we are uh, constantly fighting with OIDC, and I, I was wondering if you are planning to make secrets uh, and OIDC self-serviceable in Federal Cluster, or if it's something like too difficult to tackle or like impossible to tackle in a secure way. Okay, so short answer is no, we are not planning that, but it could be possible, it would be something that would help us at least uh, let the people do some of the things by themselves. Uh, it was, it, we just have too much to do right now that we didn't uh, have get to it yet. I think that we should plan something like this it would be nice to have it as uh, maybe it would be nice to have it as a request for Fedora project as well to actually have the uh, community involvement and see what the community thinks about that but uh, if they will use it if the, it will be usable for them and uh, then we will probably be asked to actually work on it but yeah it could be possible right now the private repository, uh, the Ansible private repository or the secrets are actually managed by only by few people from uh, specific groups. So not everybody can touch them. And right now, as you said, the ticket is usually open. Somebody from sysadmin main takes it and uh, do the work. Yeah, but having it self-serviceable would be really nice. Thank you. Uh, so in the starting phase of a community, there's always communication, the central point. So from your shared experience, what would be the lessons learned, like how to do tickets, working on stuff, or uh, inf information in general, or discussions? How would you handle this in the current perspective? So back then we had different tours, would be the those sufficient or would you say there are some improvements we would recommend this for now well usually it's easy people have already opinions so they do not really care about rules i tend to prefer using self-hosted free software not everybody does usually we let whoever is going to be in charge deciding they want Google Groups, they want Slack, they want Matrix, they want to use their own system, this kind of stuff, as long as it do not cost us too much time, that's fine. But um, yeah, there is not good practice. There is some worse practice, obviously, but uh, people do not agree on what you want. There is always trade-off, so you can discuss and if you continue to discuss, there is no community, so someone has to decide. People will complain and change later. It's not that much a big deal, I think. What do? Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest things is that, uh, like in communication channels or some of these different places, if you set up, a, we have to start by asking the people, the the con the main contributors, you know, what do they want to use or where where are they going to show up? Because if you set up these channels and then uh, it, it, no one is there, you know, it just becomes an advertisement for how this is like a dead project or you split the tension through a bunch of different places. So just kind of make sure that like what you do have is what you need and your uh, and what you're prepared to like show up at and and kind of populate because. Um, that way, because you that you're, you're going to maximize your your contributions that way. Something from the federal point of view, we actually have plenty of uh, channels uh, for communicating with others. Uh, we have discourse, we have uh, mailing list, we have uh, matrix. Uh, Telegram. Oh, I'm not sure about that. I, we had IRC as as well, but 
uh, it's still used. I'm not sure if everybody is using it. I guess there, the bridge, there was bridge between Matrix and IRC, and this is gone. Uh, so yeah, that is that is not not great. Uh, but yeah, this is actually changing because uh, the people were used to use something in past that is not uh, longer even around in some cases. And this is mostly where the people actually you can find them. It's not about uh, where uh, you like a community want to be, but where the people could uh, find you and when they will look f for you. So you need to actually think about this because if you if you have people who actually open IRC and say, oh, this is something that is really old, why would I use it? And they will just go away. <laughs> so yeah, we are seeing that sometimes, uh, mostly with uh, new contributors because they are used to something else and happens. <laughs> yeah. And I would also just add to that that wh whatever channels you you decide to use, you know, like it's really up to you to communicate it correctly, you know. So putting everything in the right places so people can find where you are, I f think that's also very crucial to this. Um, and unfortunately, I think we don't have uh, like r much time for other questions. So are there any final thoughts or some horror stories that you would like to share in one minute before we go? <laughs> I'm not sure if in one minute, <laughs> but I can share a story about the hat if somebody is interested in that. <laughs> so the story is that uh, I was starting in Fedora as a uh, contributor or maintainer of releasemonitoring.org. It's a service that is monitoring uh, new releases of the projects. And I was starting a blog post about it, and it was uh, said like it is a magic word of the releasemonitoring.org and how it works, and I was the wizard in there. And then I bought the wizard hat, and I'm uh, usually <laughs> taking it to every conference I'm going to. So. <laughs> Yeah, in one minute, no. I mean, I had plenty of horror story, like that one time when CentOS.org disappeared, that one time when all the servers were offline, that one time when Jenkins came back from the dead. But uh, sorry, I cannot tell them. You have to bribe me with chocolate later or promise of chocolate. <laughs> so you can see me and I will tell that in a very detailed uh, way. I would just say if you have uh, other questions or things that you think we could help with, just catch up with one of us uh, yeah. and uh, or our colleague, uh, Duck, there in the middle of the, the audience. Why don't you raise your hand, Duck? You can approach him. <laughs> oh, one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. 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 I can say one more word, and that is a horror word, and it's JavaScript. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy the conference. <laughs>